Well, thank you all. Great to, uh, to be with you this morning. I uh, appreciate the chance to be able to be here and uh, certainly great to see uh, some friends here, some folks that uh, we've worked together many, many years on this industry, um, and meet some other folks as well. I think you're looking forward to a great day. You'll have a lot of good speakers, uh, certainly a chance to be able to ask some questions, and then uh, a lot of others in the hall that you'll get a chance to learn from as well, just in the conversations. Uh, you'll make some friends that you'll uh, see back at these events and other events, uh, so make sure and take time to do that. Um, this is a uh, it, it's an amazing time. Every now and then we should take a chance to be able to look back and see where we came from and, and uh, see, you know, that certainly help informs us about what we need to do going forward. And you think back, you think back to the start of this industry and there's folks in here that were part of it. Um, and uh, could you imagine back in the 1980s or the 1970s thinking that we'd be We'd be here, first of all, I'm not sure we thought we'd make it through Y2K, so I don't know if we'd ever thought that we'd be in 2015, that just sounded like forever. But that someday, five billion bushels of corn, billion gallons of biodiesel would be, be, you know, be processed and moved in this, in this country through renewable fuels. I mean, you know the dozens and dozens of battles that looked like could have been the end of ethanol and biodiesel through the years. Uh, and there were a lot of folks in this room that helped us get through those. So you think of uh, the challenging times in which things started. In fact, you know, people talk about themselves uh, as a child of the 60s. I think ethanol was a child of the 80s, wasn't it? Out of necessity, it was, we had to find markets, we had to find something to get off government payments, to be able to create a demand for ourselves. And again, at that time, no one would have said you'd have 25 million gal gallon dry mill plants, let alone 100 or 250 million gallon dry mill plants. It wasn't even technically possible, let alone there wasn't any market and there wasn't a policy that would create that. There were pieces of it and you could see how some of it could come together, um, but maybe there's some folks in this room that could see it way more clearly than I. I could just see kind of, you know, the next 50 million bushels of grind. That just, that looked like it was good enough. I remember a long time we spent trying to think that someday ethanol may be bigger than corn sweeteners. Could you imagine that? Maybe bigger than HFCS? If it got that big, that'd be, you know, that's really all we want is to get bigger than that. Um, and it not only got bigger than that, but it's an industry that will collect a room full like this uh, that frankly right now, big oil and some international oil players are paying a lot of attention to because we've taken some of their market share. We got their attention, right? Um, we certainly do. Uh, that means we have a battle, but that's success of some sorts, absolutely to be that significant. Um, in fact, you, you look, we created this industry collectively um, through lots of battles, Clean Air Act amendments. There, there just were scores of those that I think some folks on the other side thought they had us <laughs> and the ethanol industry was dead. And maybe they feel the same way now or about some future battle. Um, and I think they would likely to be as successful as it were about those, during those past battles. Um, but you think about those and we created an industry now that has such an, such an impact economically in agriculture, it's flat out amazing. So, so one set of numbers I love talking about, it's, the, it's the, the, the value of agriculture production in Iowa. And I know we got folks here from all states. I know the Iowa numbers and they're very relevant to what's happened in other places. But in 2002, we have ag census in agriculture. In 2002, um, agriculture grossed crop and livestock sales $12 billion. A big number, it was a big part of the economy. It had kind of been in that 10 to 12 to 14 billion dollar range for two decades. Um, and certainly 80s were pretty ugly, but you know, it kind of settled into that kind of range. That was 2002. You know, a lot of things were happening between 2002 and 2007. Certainly a big share of that was increasing grind that was out here. We also had a China that came into the market and started buying soybeans. But 2002, $12 billion, 2007, $20 billion. 
numbers that we had never, ever seen before, $20 billion. And that would have been great all by itself, but by 2012, we hit $30 billion, up from $12 billion in 2002. And we've been hanging around that $30 billion number since. Uh, so you take, an ag, you take an economy and ag sales in Iowa from $12 billion to $30 billion in 10 years, up two and a half times, and you know what's happened out here. Obviously, land prices are more. We created more ag jobs. It's such an impact for the state, let alone for agriculture itself. And not only that, obviously, with that extra demand, we saw profitability in other crop producing regions in the world. Uh, because there was a demand, we, while we saw increasing production during that time, it's not because we didn't have any production and the prices just went up. No, actually you can't create gross, gross sales with just prices, it takes production too. We had increasing world production, but our demand grew faster than that production grew. And a big part of that, certainly in Iowa, was, was ethanol and in the U.S. was ethanol demand of crushing corn. Um, up to the place where we have five billion bushels of corn. That's actually, some of us started at a time, there wasn't much more than that in total production of corn in the country. Um, and now we're seeing that demand now. Where are we at? I think we're at a similar challenging time. You know, it's a different time, but certainly not the 80s by any means because of the things that you all did to make this industry happen. But we're at one of those turning points again one of those challenging points where we see opposition coming up against us. We see certainly, you know, as Brian pointed out uh, in some of his comments, we see folks that uh, take old arguments and try and make them new again, you know, beat up ethanol in, in, in various ways and, and talk about things that some of those things, actually some of them were never true, but some of them were actually true 10 or 15 or 20 years ago, but they're recreating those stories like they're new again. Um, and, and so we have to continue to challenge that. And I think certainly one of those things that's helped get us here recently and tried to increase our opportunity into the market because we've done all the other pieces. So, you know, if, if one of those pieces is become efficient enough in production that we don't need a tax credit anymore, oh, newsflash to some of those folks out there, we don't have a tax credit anymore. It's not a subsidized pro product anymore because of the technology advancements that many of you were a part of in making that all happen. Do we have consumer acceptance? Absolutely, we have consumer acceptance. And, and frankly, and certainly in the 10% blend market, absolute accept acceptance. We're seeing that resistance in trying to grow to the 15 or the higher blends by, in many cases, the marketers, not usually the consumers out there, but they don't have a choice, they don't have an option. Uh, and so we certainly have made advances there as well. And so you see these pieces that we've gained, now we find these walls that are set up to try and keep those advances from happening. Now that's why it's very important for us to take every opportunity, certainly to sell our friends and neighbors, to be able to appreciate those retailers that are often offering 15 and higher blends, to use as high a blend as we can as well. But then also, um, again, as Brian pointed out, when we have presidential candidates tromping through this state and pretty soon you won't be able to get up in the morning without seeing one in your driveway, I mean, they're going to be everywhere. <laughs> we need to ask them how they feel about renewable fuels and do they really mean it? Do they support an RFS? Because you know an RFS right now, it's, it's, I, I tell groups, um, non-ag groups especially, that it's an odd thing that it takes a that it takes a mandate, an RFS, a requirement to let the market work. You saw what happened this summer. Uh, just ethanol as an example. You saw ethanol being a dollar a gallon cheaper than gasoline. We should have had E85, E85 pumps and E15 pumps going up on every corner. And we should have as many E85 and E15 pumps as we have E10 pumps out there. Um, and we should have had new plant announcements, and we had a few, but not very many because we're worried about being able to sell more fuel. When it's lower priced, it, it adds qualities that gasoline absolutely needs and we should have been growing. So what wasn't allowing that? It was access to market, you all know it. And what does RFS do? It encourages those 
that are willing to invest in that infrastructure um, and causes those that aren't to be able to have a market way of being able to buy RINs and, and not invest if they don't want to. But it encourages, it makes that happen. And we need that to happen. That's actually been a promise the government has made for those in the industry that invested in growing this industry. Um, and we need that follow through on. So where are we at in that? You all know that very, very clearly. This room full knows more than most. Um, but we're still waiting actually on a 2014 <laughs> RFS. Um, we'll see when that comes out. I can't believe that we don't have a 2015 RFS. We're a month into it. Why in the world don't we have that? But I'm very nervous that that may not come until you know, mid-year from some conversations I've had with some folks in EPA. Um, then they say, we're gonna get caught up for 2016. Well, why in the world are we waiting? What's an RFS do looking back? An RFS is about looking forward. What kinds of incentives do folks have this year um, to be able to put in new marketing efforts and promotion and price their fuel in a way that they can earn RINs to be able to sell to those that aren't willing to make that investment? And that's what we need candidates, first of all, to understand. Frankly, some don't, I think, want to understand um, or haven't taken the time to understand. And then we need them to advocate, not just say, therefore, all energy, but actually advocate for RFS, you know, prove it. And, and for some of these candidates, it's going to be quite a challenge. But I think we got the better story. I think if they can show the sophistication of understanding the arguments, I think it will be very convincing to some Iowans out there and some non-Iowans about the significance of this opportunity in this industry at this time. Um, so make sure and take your time to, to talk to, to folks. We'll get a chance to talk to them and ask them questions, whether it's in your driveway or whether it's at an event someplace. Uh, they're going to be all over this state, and they should not leave the state. Uh, without constantly being reminded. And, you know, it probably takes them being asked five times before they go to an aide and say, okay, what's this RFS stuff? I got to get a little more conversant in it. So, you know, maybe you're one of those five times before they get conversant and they don't have an answer, but you are part of them developing uh, that question and that conversation uh, that will take them to the point where everybody, hopefully, can stand up at the end of this race uh, and say, I'm for the RFS as well. I'm for the RFS as well. And none of them wants to be somebody who doesn't understand and still talks about some of those old messages because frankly, that tells me a lot about how they look at the rest of public policy as well. If they don't figure this out, if they don't take the time to figure this out, then are they taking the time to figure out some of the other big policy issues uh, that are not necessarily always on our front burner, but will be on theirs uh, as they have additional responsibilities. Uh, so that's our opportunity. We have a great chance to be able to do that. We are at one of those pivot points again, and I believe that we have an opportunity to be able to continue to grow this industry. This room full of folks and a lot of folks that, that uh, maybe we're going to try and get here, depending on where they're coming from, we're a part of this and making this all happen. We should celebrate where we're at, and that should motivate, motivate us to making sure that uh, we look forward and, and take care of this industry so it has an opportunity to grow and make agriculture more profitable. So again, thank you for being here. I want to take, if there's some questions uh, or comments or a, a rebuttal, whatever it is that you all have, I'd sure take that. Yeah, if uh, anybody that has a question, if you'd come up to the mic and uh, introduce yourself and ask your question. I guess while, if we've got anybody that's coming up, if you could just comment a little bit more on the RFS, Bill, and just kind of what you hear and uh, what you think. Yeah, we had a, we had a meeting uh, with some of the folks. It was, it was not headquarters staff, and that probably made them a little more free to talk about it, but it was not headquarters staff when we were talking about the RFS. In fact, we were talking, you know, there's a few issues in agriculture that interact with EPA now. I mean, we talk waters of the U.S., we talk spill prevention control stuff, we talk lawsuits, we talk, um, you know, hypoxia task force, other kinds of things. But anyway, one of those things we talked about with, was RFS. And we said, so, I assume this was actually about a month ago. Uh, so I assume 
we're going to be having that announcement somewhere right after the first of the year anyway, because they said it wasn't going to be until 2015, uh, that we'd have an RFS. Um, and uh, you go ahead and announce the 15 RFS and the 14, because I, I would still hope that folks that generated RENs in 14 are able to have value and, and, and you make sure that that program continues to work and obviously that, that is for the most cases, but, but make sure and affirm that. Um, and they said, well, you know, RFS is kind of tough. It's a tough issue. It's, I, you know, to me, RFS is tough to make everybody happy. You won't make everybody happy, but it's not that tough an issue. You choose where you're at and you go with it. Um, you, in fact, you actually look at what the law says. That would seem like where you start. <laughs> um, and, and you make that announcement and we go forward. Um, I, I heard the suggestion that it might not be till mid-year, um, that it could even be early fall. I would hope that there is a reconsideration or this person was badly, badly informed <laughs> that that was not true. I cannot understand why we would not see an RFS now. What additional information is needed over the next six months? Um, certainly it's a huge loss of opportunity in losing the direction that an RFS provides um, by waiting that long before that comes out. In fact, at that point, we heard the conversation that even though uh, RFS 14 uh, was first announced as a proposal back in fall of 2013, uh, and the waters of the U.S. was announced as a proposal in spring of 2014, that waters of the U.S. might rule might be done before the RFS rule is actually done. Now talk about hard, I think waters of the U.S. is actually kind of hard. There's a lot of Supreme Court ruling, other kinds of stuff, now I think they're screwing it up, but it's hard. Um, RFS is choose and go, give direction, please. Yeah, Danny Mauser, Western Now Energy. Thank you for being here, Secretary yeah. Northey. Uh, just a, a question, do you work with the other uh, secretaries around the other states close by and talk about this RFS and joining together in a coalition? Yeah, great, great question. We do, um, we do so, so uh, actually next week we'll be in Washington as a gathering of, it's called NAS, the National Association of State Departments of Ag. And our Midwestern folks are locked up on it. I mean, we are supportive, of course, we'll have a few new directors of ag, and, and most of those already have a history of supporting it. They have governors that support it. Um, and again, some to a greater degree or more active degree than others, um, but we do, and we'll actually do some stuff together as MASDA, Midwest Association of State Departments of Ag. Um, obviously, when we get to NASDA, our whole organization from time to time, we have some disagreements with folks in other regions, um, and uh, so we don't generally have as much strong NASDA policy as we have in MASDA or our Midwestern folks working together um, on it. And certainly, you know, it's a, it's a, some of the secretaries are elected like I am, some of them are appointed, they all have got to take direction if, if they're appointed direction from their governor as well. Now again, in the Midwest, we have governors that are all supportive at one degree or another, some actively supporting, some not very actively supporting. Please. Yeah. Warren Bush from yeah, Western Warren. Highway Energy and Western Dubuque Biodiesel. Uh, where is it hung up at? Is it the White House? Is it the EPA? Is it Office of Budget Management? Uh, you know, uh, President Obama was a ran as a strong supporter, and you know, it's on, it seems like he's kind of backed away from uh, RFS. Great question. So I, I think you probably all heard Warren's comment, where's, where's this RFS hung up? Why does it take so long to make a decision? And I've heard it a couple different ways. Again, I'd be speculating because I'm not inside enough to know, but I've heard some to speculate that it's in an, in an OMB, that it may be in a White House, that, that it's certainly hung up in part on RINs and RIN values that somebody believes. I mean, RINs are a net. I mean, we're not, it, it's not like ethanol, it, RINs are not a tax. <laughs> RINs generate income as well as cost those that are not uh, investing. And so to me, to say that 
RINs are expensive and therefore causing the price of gas to go up. Well, we've got a REN market right now that is that has some value to it, and we got a dollar eighty-three gasoline. So it's it's not like it's adding, you know, eighty cents a gallon or sixty cents a gallon. So so I, I've heard that is part of it. There's been a lot of effort to try and push back and try and tell folks how that really works, how thin a market it is. Um, and, and that it is a response to investment by some that are doing the kinds of things uh, that, that we have asked them to do, and that's invest in infrastructure. So that's what I've heard. We have heard many good comments. I, I really certainly got the feeling from some in leadership at EPA that they were very strongly supportive of RFS, that it maybe was someplace else that some of that pressure was coming from. Um, I think there's certainly been some voices out of the White House that suggest that they're still strongly supportive. But somebody sure got cold feet about 15 months ago. Um, and somebody's got an argument made that slowed this process down in a way that, that still has stuck this in a mud in a way that's not moving forward. Um, and, and I think every, there's a lot of folks in this room that are working at trying to find that pressure point and find out what to do to be able to stop that. But, Great question. I think in order to uh, for keep things on time, if we could have one more question. I don't know if you guys want to flip. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Good morning. I'm Gary Hare with Renewable Energy Group. Um, question I have for you is with the re So I think you heard the question there, but it was about livestock prices, and do we think that that will kind of take away some of the opposition of renewable groups to RFS and, yep. Yep. Okay. okay. With, the, with the decline in grain prices, does this take away some of that opposition? You know, seven, Three and a half dollar corn doesn't uh, certainly scare cattlemen as much as seven dollar corn does, and do we see some of that? I think we're seeing a softening of that opposition, but some have so entrenched themselves in that opinion that I don't think we'll ever see them, or, or it's gonna be a long time before we see them. We should never say never. It's gonna be a long time before we see them being supportive of the kinds of things that most of us would gr agree this is something they should be supportive of. I, I get that there's regional differences. And Iowa cattlemen are very different than Texas cattlemen in the impact on their industry. And you all know how beneficial this industry is for livestock feeders in Iowa. It has been some of the growth that we have seen. Part of that $30 billion is the additional livestock production that comes from feeding DDGs. Um, our folks know it. Um, Again, I think we'll continue to see some opposition. I think we see some lessening of that. We see some lessening from the Grocery Manufacturers Association and others as well. And they were huge thorns in their side. But they did some real damage with some of the public opinion. We'll have to fight that. They would be the best to undo that damage. I don't think we can expect them to do that. But we certainly are seeing less of a pushback from them right now than, than what we once had. Again, thank you all uh, for the chance to be with you this morning. Have a great day. I know you, that you will. And thank you all for many of you were so instrumental in the creation of this industry. Now let's keep her going. Thank you all. Thank you, Secretary.